come to order, order our regular meeting of February 16th, 2021 at 4.30 p.m. Uh, may everybody uh, please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. An optional prayer tonight will be presented by Councilwoman Showerman. Please go ahead. When I am troubled, let me not forget that you are greater than my problems and that from you will come the strength I need. Nice. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Smith, may, may we have a roll call vote, please? A, a roll call of the uh, members present, please. Mrs. Clear? Here. Mr. Horton? Here. Mr. Rastetter? Here. Mrs. Rennie? Here. Mrs. Showerman? Here. Mr. Shank? Here. Chairman Anderson? Here. And next on our agenda is the hearing of the public. As I mentioned in our caucus meeting, uh, and as most of you may know, if you have called in and signed up to be on the agenda, you receive five minutes to speak. Um, and actually, I don't have the, the timer. Uh, any chance you could run that over to me, Mr. Smith? Um, <clears throat> if, if you have uh, signed up, you have uh, five minutes to speak. And uh, if you have not signed up but are here to speak this evening, you have three minutes to speak. Uh, we have uh, three members of the public that have signed up to speak and appear to be with us this evening. Um, First, first on my list is Margaret Taylor. Uh, Margaret, if you wanted to get prepared uh, to speak and give us your name and municipality, and I'll begin your time then. Okay, uh, thank you. My name's Margaret Taylor. I live at 1015 Chelsea Avenue, Erie, PA, 16505. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank members of council for all the hard work you do. I want to support your efforts to make Erie's economy grow. After researching how limited states and municipalities are in obtaining capital, I realize how much pressure you're under to hold the line on taxes while looking for ways to multiply revenue. An article titled 10 Insights into Growing Civic Wealth from an online publication, Municipal World, author Chris Heyer says, make a city brand. Erie's brand used to be dreary Erie, the mistake on the lake, and the lake was considered dead. Erie's recovered from that, as James and Deborah Fallows noted in their recent book about the rebirth of Rust Belt cities. So what is the new brand going to be? A beautiful resort town with a diverse economy, high-speed broadband and connections to larger cities by high-speed rail, affordable houses in a mecca of green spaces with proximity to a lake that looks like the ocean. With high-speed rail, a person could work in Pittsburgh and live in Erie. With high-speed broadband, businesses would have good reason to locate here. One only needs to read about what broadband did for Chattanooga, Tennessee to see the multiplying effects of improved infrastructure. Contrast that with this brand. Erie becomes famous for being the hub for plastic waste from all around the Northeast United States. Imagine the optics, large trucks barreling down the Bayfront through residential neighborhoods, depositing tons of other cities refuse into a 25 acre lot near the lake. Now, the local TV stations and Erie Times keeps mentioning that IRG is a multi-million dollar project 
as if that money's going directly into municipal coffers. But as far as I can tell, it's a tax shelter for millionaire investors. And with LERTA and Opportunity Zone tax breaks, it certainly won't be a revenue multiplier. I'll be submitting a, to council an outline of all my concerns about IRG. But I've also submitted a sample resolution I'm urging council to review. It's an endorsement of the National Infrastru Infrastructure Bank Coalition, HR Bill 6422 now gaining immense grassroots support in light of the pandemic. It's a bank based on FDR's Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and its passage would pave the way for Erie to diversify its economy while pres preserving its greatest asset. The bank would be capitalized through treasury bonds and private investors would be given preferred stock and interest 2% above. Imagine getting a 2% interest to repair and replace leaky water pipes, which cost utility companies millions. 40% of all municipalities lose revenue because of massive leakage due to old pipes. Imagine employing local people in the workforce who could dig up roads, replace the water pipes, replace the gas lines, and while they're at it, lay high-speed internet fiber optic broadband and then repave the roads when they're done. I submitted testimony on Erie's behalf for the PA State House Committee's hearing on the national infrastructure scheduled for February 17th, that's tomorrow, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. I've listed ways in which a public bank could help Erie County improve and expand its infrastructure as opposed to resorting to private lenders who focus on profits for shareholders. Available capital for these kinds of projects would be a boon to growth and might save Erie from succumbing to untested, ambiguous, and potentially disastrous business proposals like the IRG plant. I encourage council to attend a virtual community roundtable on February 25th, that's next week at 6 p.m., regarding the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Alfeca Mutardi, an economist with the NIB Coalition, will present information with breakout groups to follow. I sent an email to Nicole with the specific registration information for the roundtable virtual event. I sincerely hope that you attend. Thank you. And I was just, just at five minutes. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. That was just at five minutes. So thank you. Th thank you for your comments tonight. Uh, next on our agenda is uh, Freda Tepfer. Uh, Freda, if you could give us your name and municipality, and I'll begin your time then. Um, can you hear me okay? I'm talking to a, um, a microphone. Yeah, no, you're fine. Uh, okay, I've never done this before. Yeah, you're very clear. Uh, oh, wait a second. I'm a, I'm at 430. My name's Freda. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I'm waiting for my tax appointment. So I am here to speak. I'm sorry. Can you give us your, your name and municipality? This is Freda Tepfer, Erie 16502. Thank you. I am here to speak in favor of reducing the deduction on commissary fees. I don't think it's appropriate to use the commissary fees as a way to achieve behavior modification of incarcerated people by depriving them of largely the money that their families have put in for them. Um, I was attended the study session, if the, whatever the meeting was where the, um, the finance committee, where the warden spoke. And I hear that they have social workers and alcohol abuse counselors in the prison, but that doesn't negate the fact that there there are a large number of people there largely there because they can't make cash bail or because they have mental health or substance abuse problems and taking away the few creature comforts they have and that their family has struggled to provide for them is not an appropriate way to achieve behavior modification um, it's through it's through counseling, it's through improving conditions in the prison, 
Um, and it, it's through reducing, getting rid of cash bail. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Temp, for, for speaking today um, and, and for your comments. Uh, next, uh, that will be the last person today that has five minutes is Margaret Watts. Margaret, yeah. if you could give us your uh, name and municipality and I'll begin your time then. Yes, my name is Margaret Watts and I live in Washington Township, Edinburgh, Pennsylvania. I would like to speak about Ordinance 6, uh, 2021 and amending Ordinance 83, 2014. The poor, black and brown people disproportionately represent Pennsylvania's jail and prison population inflicting a systemic racial and economic disparity and division of inequality in our county. In Pennsylvania, black people account for 47% of the prison population, but only 10% of the total adult state population. These statistics clearly highlight what disproportion means for Erie County. The criminal justice system in Erie County in particular Erie County Prison, has additionally created a punitive sentence for the incarcerated families by thwarting their limited means for contributing to their loved ones' well-being through depositing funds into a commissary account. The punitive sentence you have placed on these families is the application of a 75% withdrawal fee on accounts funded by these destitute families in an era defined by indigence produced from a $7.25 per hour minimum wage over the last 11 years, and again, disproportionately affecting black and brown people in Erie County. Under cover of the pandemic, incomplete and incorrect data collection by the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections has restricted current pandemic related revelations. The most reliable statistics researched and published by the ACLU and the Urban Institute reports 29% of the 2016 Pennsylvania prison population was on the mental health roster and 65% of people in prison needed some type of alcohol or drug treatment. For these individuals existing in the Erie County prison, attaching more punitive actions such as finding them, finding them via their commissary account hardly resolves mental health and drug dependency problems, especially rendering short-term behavior modification. Families and friends of the incarcerated want to contribute to their loved one's basic needs amid austere conditions in isolation and breaching fears of a possible death sentence from COVID-19. The essence of humanity is having the capacity to extend care and security to others while empathetically relating to their fears and hardships. Extending humane care through a commissary account is the human response families have to show their love. And if you really want to reduce recidivism, encourage relationships that will bind the incarcerated to their home community starting now. I recall it wasn't too long ago that one of our elected officials crossed state lines during Pennsylvania's earlier lockdown to ensure and witness the safety and stabilization of their adult child's mental health status. Many of us empathize with this parent's determination and dedication to emotionally support their child. The financial ability to provide a safe means to support that child certainly could be seen as a privilege privilege many of our families of the incarcerated do not have, and likewise have a loved one with the same mental health needs as this young woman. Shouldn't a humane response for the incarcerated be available to families of the imprisoned also? Or will the record reflect, it's okay for me, but not for thee? Parents and grandparents who are or want to be present in their children's and grandchildren's lives are intrinsically compelled, compelled to embrace their loved one and give comfort. This is a basic human response. Inflating fees in 2014 and then voting to retain 75% of commissary deposits now in 2021 
during a pandemic is seemingly done with a clear disregard for families, children, siblings, parents, and grandparents who are barely making it. They only want to act on their love and conscience. I implore you to act on your conscience and do your diligence to assist families of the incarcerated in the Erie County Prison. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Watts, for your comments. Um, I know that there are several uh, citizens to be heard, but that is the, the last member of the public that is what signed up for the five minutes. Um, so we will begin as I saw the hands raised uh, and uh, each of you will have three minutes. Uh, if you can please give me your full name and your municipality, I will begin your time then. Uh, Mr. Slater, uh, I believe your hand was up first. So please go ahead. Thank you, I uh, appreciate your time. My name is Kurt Slater and I live in Girard, PA. Go ahead, please. All right, um, appreciate your time. Uh, I'm here for two issues. Uh, one is the proposed raise for the council uh, and somewhat connected is also the commissary issue that's been brought up. Um, I am an officer at Erie County Prison. Uh, prior to that, I worked 10 years at the casino in the security department uh, running the budget. So I am fully aware of the financial side on both sides and being in part of a union and uh, also uh, now uh, private sector. Uh, the first issue I'll, I'll go over quickly. Um, I think it's ill-timed to propose a, a, a raise for the council. Uh, for anybody, uh, members of the council that don't know, uh, because of COVID, because the federal grant is no longer uh, active for us in the Erie County Prison, uh, if anybody goes out for COVID, which there have been many, uh, they use their personal time or they go unpaid. Uh, to recuperate some of that funds, there have been options to go through unemployment. And if anybody is not aware, um, unemployment pays you partial of what you're supposed to get, uh, not 100% of your paycheck. So we have correction officers being out of work um, just for my facility, let alone other county employees, uh, correctional officers being out of work um, and seeing somebody propose a raise for themselves, uh, just uh, it kind of rubs us the wrong way. Secondly, commissary, in case anybody doesn't know, um, there are very few things the prison can do to help modify behavior. We are what they call a direct supervision uh, prison, which means we are one-on-one -on -one with inmates. We see them day to day. We talk with them and establish relationships. Um, inmates, for long story short, uh, when you talk with them and you establish good relationships, they will tell you the truth. And the truth is they know what the choices they make. Uh, they are not victims. Many of the people in our Erie County prison have victims, which is why they're in prison. When they misbehave, like I said, there's very few ways for us to, to modify that behavior. So I, I would really appreciate the council to personally visit the prison, um, tour the facility, know its inner workings before they make any decisions on how it's run. Uh, see some videos, go through our training, talk with officers. Uh, that's what's gonna make the difference. If you really want to know uh, the influence that you have over COs and their daily life. Uh, we see these inmates out in public. We see them at Waldemir. We see them at Walmart. You know, we have those relationships. Mr. Slater, your, your, yes, three, sir. Minutes, your three minutes is up. Thank you, sir. Okay, okay. thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, next up, again, uh, when I recognize you, if you'll give us your full name and your municipality, and I'll begin your time then. Uh, Mr. Titus, you were next. Thank you. Uh, Tyler Titus, Erie City. Go ahead, please. Um, I'm just, I'm coming for two, for two reasons. Um, one is to voice my opposition to resolution number six. I know that it's just in its first reading, but as an Erie County resident, um, I don't fully understand the need to directly link the county council regarding um, to the community college in that capacity. I fully understand though, and I'm thoroughly grateful for the immense amount of work that the council has done to bring this into fruition. Um, I just believe that this is an overextension of the power and influence of, of council over the community college. The board of trustees and the president interim or established 
have been selected and should be permitted to work towards the community college's mission and vision as they have been appointed to do. Additionally, I would like to speak uh, briefly um, to encourage the, the board to, or I'm sorry, the council to amend the ordinance 83 from 75% to zero. Uh, unless each council member can confidently vote that equity within the judicial and correction setting is fully and undoubtedly in existence. And until beyond a shadow of a doubt that we know that there's no implicit bias or inequity, the council should, not, should vote in solidarity to protect those who are being, and we have evidence and, and as much of the research that was just pointed out, um, that being taken advantage of in this situation. Um, I would argue that they do not, many of them are adults um, and many of them may be aware and are consciously aware of the choices that they are making, but what is not being accounted for in some of the, the depictions is that these people, not just inmates, these people um, are often forced into crimes of poverty or having to make choices that they would not have to make if all the other systems around them were equitable. Um, so I just, I lean into the council and ask you to reconsider yes, from 75% um, to 25% is a, is a big jump, but I would ask that you push to 0% as, as these people need our voice uh, just as much as the rest of, of the Erie County residents. And with that, I, I can see the rest of my time. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments today. Um, next, uh, Mr. Gary Horton uh, uh, was in the chat. I didn't see him having a hand up, uh, but uh, Mr. Horton, uh, please give us your full name, yes. municipality, and I'll start your time then. Okay, my name is Gary Horton, and I am uh, from Erie City, and uh, I'm here today as a representative of the NAACP to make these uh, comments that uh, about a progressive county, progressive enough to establish uh, election reform and expand election rights, uh, but deny prison rights or prison reform. Uh, I think is punitive on families. Uh, that's not the prisoner's money. It's technically money coming from uh, others as it was stated. Uh, when you are in state prison, I heard that used as one uh, model uh, that it happens in the state prison. Uh, well, the state also pays their prisoners and they also employ their prisoners. And so when they take money from their prisoners, they're taking the prisoner's money. They're not taking his mother or his grandmother's hard earned money or money off his children's table. And it just seems rather punitive. You should suspend or... Uh, uh, put this law in some type of abeyance until the legality of it is at least established. Uh, and then if it is established that it is appropriate, it seems to be more uh, uh, feasible for a, uh, or appropriate for gaming funds as opposed to people who can ill afford to pay it in that. The people in prison uh, as the one gentleman said, maybe they are there. Uh, they're still considered innocent until proven guilty, you know, and that, and they should have some kind of due, due process. And so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if the, if the council would be as targeted in their uh, establishing uh, this kind of effort in your employment, when you look at county employment, the people you're employing under the CARES Act, the new people you're hiring, the people you appoint to boards, commissions, and authorities. Are you as inclusive uh, or uh, diverse and equitable or only on prison reform? And so uh, I would just uh, make those comments uh, in the spirit of a country uh, and a national leader that's looking to establish prison reform that we put our minds to that effort in that direction as opposed to punishing families who cannot afford to get their family members out of jail. And so they put money in their account to make their stay so they can brush their teeth and wash their face and comb, get a haircut. And then we reach into the pocket and take it or to enter their pot and take it. I just think there's ought to be a better way to do that. I understand the idea of having authority and whatever and that, but I just, I don't think uh, that we've got the right idea. I thank you for your time and attention 
and I look forward to, if you're establishing this committee of all voices about the community college, that you put some community people's voice there also, and not just put a committee where you're represented again, Thank and the administration you. is represented again, and the community Thank is you. not represented or does not have a voice. Thank you, Mr. And that, uh, Again, I thank you and yep. your deliberation. Yep. Thank, thank you for your three minutes today. And thank you for your comments. Um, next, we have uh, Cindy Purvis. Uh, Ms. Purvis, if you want to give us your full name and address, and I'll begin your time then. Cindy Purvis. I live in the city of Erie. Um, first, I'd like to thank all of you for all of the work that you do. The more I listen to these meetings, the more I see how much you do. I am totally in favor of you giving future members a raise um, for all the work that you do. Also, um, I really think that our warden and all of the staff at the prison, they have a very, very difficult job. And I think that we should try to find a way to compensate people that need to leave work because of COVID. But let me go further to say it's been really difficult getting information about the prison. I sent five questions to the county and I was told I had to file a right to know request. Um, and then I was told that uh, they couldn't answer all of my questions. They can only give me forms. So anyway, I did get a lot of information, but there's still a lot missing that I will follow up on. My information says there's only 26 counties in Pennsylvania that have this type of system in their county prisons. I know for a fact that our state prison system does not do this. I think asking our warden and our, and our staff at the prison to be involved in behavior modification is ludicrous. It's absolutely ludicrous. I would hope you take this uh, proposed or the 75% down to zero. I think this is a practice I as a citizen am ashamed of. Um, and uh, we should not put behavior modification on the backs of people. I don't think that's what the job of our prison is, behavior modification. That's meant for the the experts in the work that they do. So I thank you very much for your time. Ms. Purvis, thank you for your comments today. Uh, next, I saw uh, Mr. Art Leopold. If you could give us your full name and municipality and I will start your time then. Sure, my name's Art Leopold. I live in Mill Creek. Uh, honored, go uh, ahead, go ahead sure. <clears throat> honored councilman, esteemed gentle, uh, council women, honored guests and citizens. Um, I speak today regarding Ordinance 6, amending Ordinance 83 of 2014 regarding revised fee schedule of the Department of Corrections. I want to say first off, I echo a lot of the sentiments of the previous speakers, Margaret, Frederick, Margaret and others. I had a privilege and opportunity to speak two years ago in front of council, if you recall, uh, in favor of lowering the fees. And council uh, did indeed do so, but met a veto. So I would request that council think about providing a veto proof vote. I would prefer that the fees be zero. I don't think this is necessary. And in closing, I'd like to say each one of you, think if you had a loved one in prison, incarcerated, and you wanted to make a connection with them and assist them, and you put $100 in their account only to understand that 75 of what was taken away, um, that's not proper, that's not respectful, and that's not really the way that we as a county want to be known to treat uh, the least of us. So please consider an affirmative vote on the resolution, if not zero, certainly to 25%. And please make it a veto proof vote. Thank you so much. Thank you kindly this evening. 
Thank you for your comments, Mr. Leopold. Uh, next, I saw uh, Mr. Chuck Nelson uh, with his hand raised. If you can give us your full name and municipality, I'll start your time then. And please go ahead. Hey, Chuck Nelson, Erie. Um, as, the, as the one worker from the county jail had suggested going to see how things run there, I, I would suggest seeing how things run at other prisons, maybe more so, because this policy isn't particularly innovative, it's rather aggressive. Um, as one of the other people had pointed out, 26 counties, um, and they had talked about the work being done at other counties. Allegheny County has the opportunity to work. There are plenty of chances for prisoners to work in these settings. And in those cases, I think there's some uh, justification for this. But this is strictly coming from support of families that you're penalizing. Uh, now, I understand there's two uses for it. And as the one uh, worker had pointed out, it's used um, you know, as, as a way of managing the population. Uh, I mean, I think punitive would be the, the obvious word for the description there as, as penalty for the, the residents that we have that are in prison right now. And the other point of it would be cost recovery. Now, when thinking about the cost recovery, I really do not see the cost as being uh, needing to be placed on the prisoners. They're not there uh, and needing to pay rent. They're not there by their own volition. They're there as a service of the county, which means they're there for me, not for themselves. Um, so if, if this is a matter of cost recovery, if this is a matter of them not paying their rent, uh, it costs $43,000 a year to keep them, I say we evict them. If you can't pay rent, let's evict them. I think that would save the city county much more money if we let a lot more of these guys out. But if that's not really on the table, I think we should at least, at least consider reducing the, uh, the rates and the fees that come from it. It's not just the 75% coming off. If, you, uh, if you're visiting someone in jail and you walk out and you want to put a $20 bill in the kiosk to put on their books, there's a $4 fee on that. Take the 75% off of that. That leaves them with $4. So not just as Art was saying that I'll put $100 on and end up with $25. No, this is, this is a higher rate because of the fees associated with how we give the money. And then the markup on stuff. 18 ounces of peanut butter costs $4.85. I could walk out, put $20 towards a friend that I'm visiting. And they can't buy peanut butter. They can't get a haircut because that's something that's charged for. They can't get rides to the doctor, something we charge. We charge for a lot of ridiculous things. So when these debts are being racked up, they're being racked up on things that are, that are basic human services that these people should be having. Anyways, I can see my time. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Nelson. Uh, next up, and I apologize, I can't see your full name, but Antonio. Um, if you could give us your full name and municipality, and I'll start your time then. Oh, I see it now. Antonio Howard. Mr. Howard, go ahead. Uh, my name is Antonio Howard, um, Fairview, Pennsylvania. Um, I come to you as a citizen, um, newly returned from uh, a life sentence in prison. Um, I was actually an individual who, at the age of 15, served time in Erie County Prison. Um, and... For me, I think that it is amazing and very interesting to hear uh, our lawmakers consider forced poverty as a viable behavioral modification tool. And it makes me wonder if the same implications can be attributed to poverty outside, right? If this is really a viable option. Um, taking 75% of any income that comes to a prisoner from his family does not effectively modify the behavior for the positive. I was one of the ones subjected to fees and costs while I was in prison. And I can assure you it fosters resentment against the community, resentment against family, because there's this false belief that our families don't support us. It, 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 it offers evidence that our society doesn't want our families to reach back to support us, to reconnect us, to rehabilitate us, to heal our wounds or to hear our voices. And it's unfortunate that it would be couched under the auspices of behavioral modification 
and to speak to the individuals who suggest that county council should go to Erie County Prison to see how few methods they have to control inmates. I would do one better. I'd offer you the opportunity to live there, to live there and experience it. And tell me what effective behavioral modification it is. Every friend I've had, every minute I spent there without anything, I, I, I plotted on other people to steal, to gamble in any way, shape, form, or fashion to try to better my conditions because none of the legal money people sent to me was mine. It was taken. It was stolen. So I always felt that when I was growing up there, that the viable option for me was to steal back, try to balance the scales. So anybody proposing this as a viable behavioral modification tool is lying, foolish, and it's an investment in future returns. And the, the internal damage that it does to us coming out here, I can assure you, I can assure you, it does not make our community even safer because we come out here trying to reconcile the problems that we had in there based upon our forced poverty. And I would ask you to reconsider taking, stealing money from people in prison and their families. Mr. Howard, your three minutes is up. Thank you for your comments today. Uh, next is Pastor Charles Mott. Uh, if you could un unmute and then give us your full full name and municipality, and I'll begin your time then. No, oh, you're you're muted now. You you show that you're muted. Okay, go ahead. His microphone isn't working. Yeah, I can't, we can't hear you. Would, would you like to call into my phone and I'll I'll, I'll put it on speaker and I think we should be able to hear you if you'd like to do that. We still can't hear you. Pastor Mock, do you want to call into my phone and we can put you on speaker? We, we can see you on video. We just can't hear you. Can, can you hear me? Um, okay, he's, he's having some tech, technical difficulty. Are there other citizens to be heard besides the list that, that I have gone through? I didn't see any other hands raised or any Anybody else on the um, the chat who had asked for for time? Any other citizens to be heard? I'd like to make a comment. Um, okay, so please go ahead. Please identify your, your full name and municipality, and then uh, I'll begin your time then. My name is Cheryl Horton Jong, and I'm from um, Erie. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, and my only comment is this, is that um, decades ago, actually over 100 years ago, um, debtor's prison was ruled unconstitutional. It became illegal. Somehow, the system has found a way to bring it back around and legalize it again. You pick these young men up for child support or lack of child support. They don't have the money right there. That's the first thing that lets you know you, you got them. But then you put them in there, and any money that comes in for them 
to live sort of a decent stay while they're there is taken, like everybody has said, and it's applied to wherever it doesn't need to go. It goes to anybody but them. Okay, then they may go on work release. And after they get out of work release, you make some kind of deal with them about being able to now pay because they got to pay room and board when they're in there too. You're now charging them rent to be in the prison. If you catch them back out on the street again and these fines have accumulated, you're picking them back up again and you're putting them back in jail again and you have to stop it. You got to find a better way to deal with this because all it is is um, current day uh, debtor's prison, okay? And I'm done. I'm sorry, th thank you for those comments uh, today. Uh, Pastor Charles Mock uh, was having some technical difficulty. Uh, he's actually called in on my cell phone, so I'm going to put him on speaker and give him his three minutes. Uh, please let me know if you can hear him okay. Pastor Mark, go ahead. Hello, Justin, can you hear me? Members of council, let me know whether you can hear me. Yes, if you could give us your name, your name and municipality, and I'll start your time then. All right. Pastor mm -hmm. Charles Mark, Erie. Thank you, go ahead. And for bending over backwards so that I can make a, a few comments in this allotted time. And thank you, Council, for your deliberations on all of the issues of today. I want to mention that I have a doctor of ministry and prison reform and public policy. And not to brag or anything, but to just let you know that um, these kinds of issues were the kind of Lost them. Chairman, we can't hear Pastor Mock. I'm sorry, Pastor Mock. Pa Pastor, they're, they're having some difficulty hearing you, so I'm going to try and put you up closer to the mic. Okay, go ahead. All right, thank you, and let me try to talk a little louder. Is that better? Okay, they, they can hear you. Pa Pastor, I'm going to start your time over. If you could please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chairman Anderson, and to all of the council members. Thank you for this opportunity to share very briefly. Uh, I was saying in the very beginning that I have a little insight into prison reform because my doctorate of ministry is in prison reform and, and public policy. And based on Michelle Alexander's uh, blockbuster book, uh, The New Jim Crow Mass Incarceration, uh, there is a
losing him again. And second, we would ask that the, the warden would provide research that shows a direct link between behavior modification and also these exorbitant fees. I think it's taxation without representation. I think it's punitive, not only to the individuals, but also to the families and to the grandmothers. I've been a chaplain in both the county jail and also the correctional institution. And uh, I understand the challenges, the emotional and mental challenges, and these kind of fees to individuals who are struggling to make ends meet is simply a part of the kind of revenge and justice system that restorative justice is trying to reverse. So I, I'm against any kind of fee. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Pastor Mark, for your comments today. Okay, are there any other citizens to be heard? Uh, Mitch Carmen. Yes, uh, Mitch Carmen, City of Erie. Uh, please go ahead. You have three minutes. Uh, I just like to speak on some of the um, items that were talked about with this uh, resolution for cutting the fees. One, I, I've heard some information. I just want to clear some stuff up. Um, inmates that work uh, do have an opportunity to work at Erie County Prison. Um, I'm familiar with that. I I am employed there. Um, I also, unfortunately, have had um, one of my um, sons in here as well. So, um, so I have that experience as well. Um, for, a, as a family member, uh, I did not um, put money on his account. Uh, I do know that that all his basic needs were met. Um, my thing was, I didn't want to encourage or you know have have him think that this was a place that he should be at you know i didn't want him to think prison was a place hey you want to keep coming back to um he was uh, a sentenced inmate there's the inmates that are that are not sentenced are not charged fees you have to be sentenced um he had several i'm not going to speak on his charge but he said he had been in here two different times for for different um offenses and um had not had money on on his account um, and, and, and still was able to survive just fine. And, and actually, you know, I, I felt better about him being in the, in the facility than, um, being outside the facility because of the lifestyle that he chose at the time. So uh, I, I know firsthand a lot of what we're talking about as far as, um, the staff that's here about the training. I, I, I was at one time the training coordinator here. So I know that the, the care that goes into that. Uh, I'm sure people people get a, a different idea when they see things on TV, um, but I, I can tell you that you have a, a group of professionals working at the Erie County Prison. Um, they do a fine job day in and day out. Uh, by and large, the size of this institution, you have people that that are compassionate towards the inmate population. They they understand their their local. Most of the people are right here in the in the community so they understand the plight that's going on. Um, and, and so I, I, I've, I've heard a, a lot of different talk about it, but I just wanna clear some of that stuff up. Um, how, how you affect change, um, th there are very few tools. One of those tools when we're talking about behavior man, uh, modification, we're talking about uh, people that break things, that get into fights, there's only so many so many avenues that you can that you can be punitive with that, and so that is a behavior modification. The, the stats don't don't lie. Uh, the, the stats have been turned over to county council. Are you know the the, the numbers of of uh, institutional misconducts are down. You know uh, since raising those fees. That's not that's not inflated. That's since 2014. So you guys have that information and there, Mr. Carmen. I'm, I'm sorry, I let you go over a little bit, but your your three minutes has expired. Sir, I appreciate the time to, to express my views and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments today. Yes, sir. Are there any other citizens that wish to be heard? I don't see anyone else in the chat uh, or a hand raised. So are there any other citizens that wish to be heard? 
And one last time, any other citizens that wish to be heard? Okay, seeing none, we will move forward with our agenda. And next on our agenda uh, is the approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. I'll second it. Motion by Councilwoman Clear and seconded by Councilwoman Showerman. Are there any questions or comments from members of council? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Smith, can we have a roll call vote, please? On the motion to approve the minutes, Mrs. Clear? Yes. Mr. Horton? Yes. You're, you're Mr. Muted. Rastatter? Yes. Andre. Mrs. Rennie? Yes. Yes. Mrs. Showerman? Yes. Mr. Shank? Yes. Chairman Anderson? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sparber, do we have uh, any reports from the county executive or her designee this evening? No reports tonight, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sparber. Uh, next on our agenda is a report of the uh, finance chairperson, uh, finance chair clear, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the finance committee met on Thursday, February 11th. And I'm going to be submitting um, some items to the agenda under old business items A and C and new business items A through I. Thank you very much. I can, um, I am finished, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Uh, we also uh, had a meeting of the personnel committee and uh, personnel chair, uh, Mary Rennie, if you could give us your report, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The personnel committee met on Thursday, February 11th. Uh, tonight I am bringing under old business item B, the second reading of ordinance five and under new business, I am bringing items J through U. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda are uh, reports from members of council. And uh, first up, uh, Councilman Andre Horton uh, wishes to give a report. Mr. Horton, uh, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, in light of all of the comments, the lengthy citizens, and I love it uh, when our citizens are heard, I'll give you the short version. <laughs> we recently witnessed a coup attempt at the Capitol in Washington, D.C. We watched the Confederate flag raised, and it was a reminder of a dark time in our history uh, that we still uh, haven't quite got over. It invoked, for me, visions of slavery, the Civil War, lynchings, castrations, all at the town square uh, while the picnic went on. It invokes visions of white-only drinking fountains, Blacks not allowed to sit at lunch counters or use public accommodations or ride to the back of the bus. The end of slavery that actually didn't end here in Pennsylvania for 60 years after the Gradual Abolition Act of 1878. If you were a slave uh, and you had children in Pennsylvania, your children were, remained slaves until the age of 28. Jim Crow launched us right into the Jim Crow era. Runaway slaves, free black men, poor whites, all arrested, oftentimes on trumped up charges, sent to what they used to call the poor house to work off their fines and fees. I won't talk about the 40% of blacks in the prison, blacks and browns in prison. But I will say that we're only 7% uh, of Erie County residents. Let that soak in. I understand that my colleagues are going to offer an amendment this evening uh, to try to cut the baby in half with the wisdom of Solomon. 50-50 deal, but I'm here to tell you, 
as Al Sharpton used to say, if you stick a knife in my back and then you pull it out halfway, you still have the knife in my back. Uh, I'll just leave it there and I'll thank uh, all of the people who have made their comments uh, for pro and con. This is a democracy. Uh, we still have a democracy despite what happened at the Capitol. Uh, and this is a place where we all can be heard. And we may not all agree, but we can all and should be heard and respected. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Horton. Are there any uh, other members of council that wish to uh, have a report this evening? <clears throat> Being none, we'll move forward with our agenda. Uh, under old business, uh, Mr. Smith, could we have a uh, second reading of ordinance number three in title only? only? A second reading of ordinance number three, 2021, approving a single vendor contract with Westlaw to provide legal research platform for the Erie County Law Library. So move. Second. Second. Moved by Mr. Horton and second by Mr. Rastetter. Any uh, comments or discussion from members of council? Seeing none, uh, may we have a roll call vote, Mr. Smith. An ordinance number three, Mr. Horton. Yes. Mr. Rastatter. Yes. Mrs. Rennie. Yes. Mrs. Showerman. Yes. Mr. Shank. Yes. Mrs. Clear. Yes. Chairman Anderson. Yes. Thank you. Uh, may we have a second reading of ordinance number five in title only, please. A second reading of ordinance number five, 2021, elected official salary ordinance for 2022 through 2025. So moved. Second. Uh, it was moved by uh, Councilwoman Clear, seconded by Councilman Horton. Any questions or comments from members of council? Uh, seeing none, I, I have some comments that I'd like to make on this particular ordinance. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilwoman Rennie, uh, you have some comments. Please go ahead. Thank you. I was a little late getting my hand up. Um, I did listen and I have heard the comments by our constituents and by Erie County concerned citizens regarding pay increases for elected officials. Um, I served as the chair of the committee to examine compensation and uh, I need to tell everyone that we took this very seriously. We looked at salaries across Pennsylvania and um, I think people need to know that we're not voting ourselves a pay increase. This will take effect next year. And uh, it, it only involves people who are not presently voted into those positions. Um, I think that it needs to be said that, uh, you know, we're aware that it is a pandemic year. However, I don't, think that most people understand that these positions only get a pay raise every four years. It gets mapped out then. So this is the time for legally establishing that pay classification. With county council salaries in particular, we want people who are good public servants. We want people who represent the diversity of our community. And what a shame it would be if county council only consisted of, of retirees. That's something that we don't want to see. The county council pay has not kept pace with the cost of living. In fact, it is far below that of the minimum wage. And I, I think that's something that other people are not aware of. Last year, county council voted a raise for 300, approximately 369 non-bargaining, non-union positions within the county. 
And so for us to say that we won't vote a pay raise that by the way, keeps us well below, keeps those council members 30% below the cost of living over the last 35 years, I, I think is just disingenuous. And so I, I do support this. I think it's common sense. And um, I would like to thank the other council members who served on this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilwoman Rennie. In any other uh, members of council, Councilwoman Clear. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess I wanted to um, also thank the people that served on the committee. Um, and I, I think Councilwoman Rennie um, said everything that I would have said except 4,000 times better um, and uh, explained how this works. This is not, we're not giving our, ourself a raise. It's for the future. Uh, it's for those that will be elected um, next year. And I think that that's a, a, an important distinction. But Mary, thank you for um, all of the research you did on this. Uh, I, I, I really, I, I know, I, I really want to, th th that to be said out loud to everyone. You did a, a remarkable amount of research um, in order to prepare all of us for this. So um, this, uh, thank you very much for leading the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilwoman Clear. Any other members of council? Okay, then I, I'm gonna make some final comments. And uh, uh, once again, I wanna thank uh, Councilwoman uh, Rennie for chairing this committee uh, and Councilwoman Clear and Councilwoman Showerman for serving on the committee. Uh, and I, uh, as uh, Councilwoman Clear said, Councilwoman Rennie has pretty much uh, laid it out, uh, but I wanna do it a little bit more uh, succinctly and say, that one of the duties of county of being elected to county council is to set the salary of all of the other elected officials uh, in county government in Erie County. This is not county council stepping forward and giving ourselves a raise uh, or trying to line our own pockets. Uh, this is a duty and responsibility uh, that we have. Uh, and as they said, uh, this city uh, this, this committee and all the rest of the uh, members of council uh, take this responsibility as we do with all responsibilities very seriously. Uh, to somehow try and uh, use this as uh, some type of political agenda or political propaganda uh, or some kind of shots at members of council uh, for, for standing up and, and taking on the responsibility uh, that they uh, have been elected uh, to, to take on uh, is actually somewhat absurd. Uh, and uh, so for those people who attempt to do that, uh, perhaps you would be enlightened uh, tonight uh, to understand clearly what it is uh, that the duties of, of county council members uh, are. We've often said many times that the buck stops here with us. Uh, the buck stops here when it comes to the finances of Erie County. Uh, and this is another one of those circumstances uh, where that occurs. Um, you, you know, there's a lot of talk that goes on about how we need to get uh, better qualified people, uh, more professional people, younger people involved in the process. Uh, many times uh, that is done uh, through the salary that's set uh, consummate to the job that someone might be seeking. And uh, for way too long, uh, it has uh, gone on that the salaries of the council members uh, and other uh, elected row officers of Erie County uh, falls below uh, that of, of other uh, uh, communities and counties around the state. Now, I would submit that not one single member of this council uh, is uh, elected to this position uh, because of the salary or concerned about the salary. Uh, they do it, and of course I do it certainly uh, because we're committed to the community. Uh, but if we are going to uh, look to the future, and that's what this is all about, this is about the next round of uh, salaries that are being put forward for the next elected officials and beyond. Uh, 
the uh, elected official salaries are the only salaries uh, in the county council office is the only office that the salaries have not been taken care of with adjustments uh, to what was put together as uh, the pay plan for Erie County. Uh, now the elected officials fall outside of the pay plan, um, but uh, they have not been adjusted uh, as many of the positions in the pay plan have been adjusted. Uh, the argument that it's come down to us over and over again was that the duties and responsibilities continue uh, to, uh, to grow. Uh, and that is certainly uh, no less uh, evident with uh, the members of county council or other elected officials. Uh, we have a nearly $425 million budget that we're responsible for uh, and endless departments and regulations uh, that come down. We certainly wanna have people that have the ability uh, and have the education to be able to do this job. Uh, we owe that to the members of this community and the members of this community deserve that. Uh, so when we put this forward, it is uh, to fulfill our duties. Uh, I would say that I do not agree with uh, the way uh, in which the adjustments were made. Uh, I think they fall short of uh, exactly what we are trying to do to adjust uh, these salaries to uh, get younger people uh, involved and, and uh, uh, more professional people uh, to take these positions. Uh, for example, with the county executive salary, uh, for that salary to fall below uh, some of the department heads, um, I do not think that, that it is proper the, that that take place. Um, for the county council salaries to move forward at 3%, uh, I do not think that, that that is ever going to catch us up to a position uh, consummate to where uh, these positions should be set. Uh, and I think we're a long ways away uh, from doing that. Um, so uh, we will get the criticism, however, uh, whether we move it forward uh, and, and, and really make adjustments to these salaries or whether we do it at 3%. Uh, but uh, I respect the work of the committee, uh, and uh, I would say that the committee has taken into effect uh, certainly the pandemic uh, and the, uh, uh, the issues that all of us are, are going through uh, with the pandemic, and uh, what they've put forward uh, is what they believe uh, are reasonable. Uh, and as it's been said, uh, those salaries are set uh, for four years, and they do not get adjusted uh, in between those times. So I thank the committee for their work. And Mr. Smith, can we have a roll call vote, please? On ordinance number five, Mr. Rastetter? Yes. Mrs. Rennie? Yes. Mrs. Showerman? Yes. Mr. Shank? No. Mrs. Clear? Yes. Mr. Horton? Yes. Chairman Anderson? No. Next on our agenda is the second reading of ordinance number six of 2021 in title only, please, Mr. Smith. Second reading of ordinance number six, 2021, amending ordinance 83 of 2014, revised fee schedule and Department of Corrections. So move. I'll second it. We have a motion by Councilman Horton, seconded by Councilwoman Showerman. Are there any other comments or uh, questions in regards to this particular ordinance? I'll make some comments. Mr. Horton, please. Yes, it's all been said. Um, I'm gonna make this a last ditch effort to employ you. I thought 25%, I thought it should be nothing. <laughs> uh, I thought 25% uh, 
was a compromise. Um, I still question the legality of it. Uh, I'd like to know what's going on if it does pass or however it comes out. I'd like to know where that money's coming from. I mean, where that money is going to, who it's being taken from. Is there a chronological, or is there, is there an account balance or ledger? Uh, is it something that the controller uh, has access to? Because right now, uh, getting most of that type of information from the prison is like pulling teeth. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Horton. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Rastetter. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, I hear everybody speaking tonight and uh, I am totally in favor of looking into this more uh, as far as the legality and the percentage and everything. And I'd, I'd like to move to amend the ordinance to uh, bring the fee down to 50% instead of 75. Only thinking about what we're gonna do tonight. If we're gonna do anything we want to do something that's not just going to get vetoed and is going to make some kind of progress. So with that in mind, I uh, move to uh, amend the ordinance and bring that fee down to 50% instead of 75. And I think we should look into it in, in depth. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion to amend the ordinance to 50%. Second. So we have a motion by uh, Councilman Rastetter, seconded by Councilman Shank. Is there any other uh, further discussion on the amendment? Uh, Count Councilwoman uh, Rennie first. Thank you. I do agree that there are massive problems with our criminal justice system, not just in Erie, nationwide. I do agree that systemic racism and exists, and I think it contributes to the situation in our prisons. I also think that the criminal justice system unfairly punishes those living in poverty. With that being said, uh, I also am familiar with Warden Sutter, and I do not think that the sins of the criminal justice system totally fall upon our own corrections system. The prison is charged with maintaining order and safety and acting in the interests of the citizens at large for Erie County. And that is my understanding as far as what the fee schedule is designed to do. I do believe that there is more information to be had. I agree with Councilman Rastetter comments. And I do suggest that some type of a committee or task force be established to study the situation and get down to the facts because uh, that is one thing that we have heard conflicting testimony about and I, I, think, um, I think it would behoove us to get more information on it before acting further, uh, whether it's on the commissary fees or whether it's on uh, studying additional fees that are being charged. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Rennie. Uh, Councilwoman Showerman. Yes, I appreciate all the comments that were made from people that came online tonight. Uh, to talk to us. But I also want to say that they, the majority of them were not here when the warden spoke to us and we reviewed the statistics and reviewed what the money was taken for. And it was reinforced that money is not routinely taken out of, taken out of accounts unless there is misbehavior. And uh, the warden was able to show us that the statistics on assaults and fights and other uh, mannerisms of misbehaviors were way down once this was uh, practice was put in place. Um, I agree also with looking into it uh, further as far as the legality goes. 
Um, but I do want to stress to the people that were not here that money is not just routinely taken away from the prisoners. It's taken from their privilege account for the commissary. Um, and if they misbehave, they lose some privileges. It's not taken for any other reason. And I think it's That's important true. to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of council that wish to be heard? Yes, one more, one quick comment. Um, but Mr. Horton, I'll, I'll uh, address that comment in my uh, remarks, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, any, any other, any other uh, members of council wish to be heard? And, and normally, just so, so the public knows, uh, e each of us, when we're recognized to, to make comments on an issue, uh, we're recognized once when we come to the formal meeting, and then uh, we continue to move forward. Uh, but uh, I, I wanted to make some uh, comments uh, before we take this to a vote. Uh, and first, we'll be voting on it a, uh, as amended, or, or the potential amendment to it. Um, I uh, supported uh, two years ago uh, with Councilman Rastetter and certainly with Councilman Horton uh, moving these commissary fees from the 75% to 25%. Um, and for all the reasons that have been stated uh, by uh, numerous people that have brought forward uh, the, the fact that uh, this seems to be, uh, if, if not uh, exorbitant, uh, uh, close to being uh, exorbitant, and uh, and it it certainly um, has been a, a very uh, difficult uh, situation to get our arms around as to uh, exactly what is being charged to what uh, on the commissary fees. Uh, some people say it's just against those who are being penalized, uh, but uh, those who say that they know what's happening inside the prison. Uh, say that it occurs to everyone, uh, not to mention the fact that there is a $4 fee uh, charged anytime uh, money is put in. So for every $100, that's an additional 4%. Um, and, and I think that was alluded to by uh, comments uh, made earlier by Mr. Nelson. Um, it's been suggested that uh, in, if they don't wanna get hit with the fees, uh, they can go in on the computer uh, and actually uh, go around that system uh, and add money online. However, uh, the people who are being affected, uh, many, many of them do not have computers. They do not have access to the internet. Uh, and so it is right back to exactly uh, what we've been talking about. And that is, uh, this is a poor tax. Uh, this is a tax that um, uh, uh, unfortunately uh, hits uh, those that can least afford it the most. Uh, and it is, uh, you know, something that uh, without question uh, uh, is, is just absolutely, uh, you know, something that needs to be changed. Uh, it's been suggested to us um, by the administration, uh, by the director of administration himself and the warden, uh, that this has specifically been used for a behavioral modification technique. Uh, then it was suggested that that's not really what it's being used for. Um, it's only being used for those people uh, that, that cause damage to the prison. Uh, and it's been suggested that um, the taxpayers are gonna end up paying the bill uh, if we lower these fees. Uh, well, first of all, uh, when somebody is in prison, the taxpayers are, are paying the bill uh, anyway. Uh, and in fact, we pay the bill to the, uh, to the tune of $43,000 a year uh, per prisoner. Um, but we've been fighting for many, many years to get a community college where we could give people opportunity for $3,000 a year. Uh, and uh, they, they don't seem to think that the price of $43,000 a year uh, is too exorbitant uh, to, uh, to absorb. Um, it, it is a ridiculous uh, argument uh, to say that we are uh, attempting to, uh, uh, to hurt those uh, that, that are already hurting. Uh, there's no question that somebody who commits a crime uh, is, is incarcerated and is in prison 
uh, because they've committed that crime. Um, but uh, we don't need to, uh, to, to continue to turn this into a socioeconomic, uh, we'll say, uh, war against uh, the, the poor uh, and those that are disadvantaged. Um, and so, uh, you know, th it's time that, that, that this be changed. Um, it's been suggested that county council should stay out of the business of the prison. Uh, well, this is a, a county council created um, resolution uh, that started at 25%. Uh, it was increased to 75%. Uh, and the statistics across the country are showing that uh, prison systems uh, and, and from each state uh, are beginning to realize uh, that charging these exorbitant fees uh, is not working. In fact, it's working adverse uh, to what they thought it was. So the fees are being lowered or eliminated. Uh, and one only needs to point to the fact that there was a, a $60,000 uh, uncollected rate in the prison in 2013 and that amount is $4.3 million today. Um, I would suggest that there's something wrong with the way in which we are attempting to move the needle on the system uh, when we uh, have that kind of a, uh, a policy uh, that has that kind of a non-collection rate. We spend millions of dollars on giving people second chance uh, and we promote the idea of giving people a second chance. Uh, yet we are uh, burdening them with a uh, chain around their neck uh, when they come out of the prison of these uncollected rates following them to collection agencies. Uh, they cannot get apartments, they cannot get cars, they cannot get to a work environment. Uh, they are stuck in the system uh, and many of them tend to return to that system. Uh, if we're actually going to make changes that are going to be positive and proactive, uh, we need to begin uh, with the commissary fees uh, that they're being charged. And we need to look for a better way, a more progressive way to be able to uh, discipline behaviorally uh, and to be able to uh, modify uh, what it is that the, uh, the prison system is saying uh, that they're hoping to correct. So uh, with that said, uh, Mr. Smith, on the amendment, could we have a roll call vote, please? And this is to change from uh, the, uh, the initial ordinance, reducing to 25%, changing that to 50%. Mr. Smith? Mrs. Rennie? Could I ask for clarification again? I'm sorry. Yes, this go, is to... yes go ahead. This is just, just to amend this ordinance instead of 25%, making it 50%. Thank you. Yes. Mrs. Showerman? Yes. Mr. Shank? Yes. Mrs. Clear? You're on mute, uh, Councilwoman Clear. No. Mr. Horton? No. Mr. Rastatter? Yes. Chairman Anderson? No. Motion uh, passes 4-3. Thank you. Can we uh, then have any uh, questions or comments on the agenda as amended, uh, reducing the fee to 50%? No further questions or comments. Uh, I'll make a comment. Yeah, Mr. Rastutter, go ahead, please. Well, as I said before, I've heard all the all the talk about it, and I'm in favor of really looking into this problem. But as for tonight, in order to make some progress on this issue, I have amended it to be 50% instead of 25, to go from the 75 down to 50%, to make a compromise that will help the issue for now. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. And uh, Mr. Rastetter, th thank you for uh, bringing forward uh, your amendment uh, and the research that you did in finding that uh, the state correctional facilities uh, have uh, imposed across the board a 50% on the commissary fee, uh, making uh, what, what you're bringing forward uh, in line with uh, the, those rates uh, in the state prison, Pennsylvania state prison system. Uh, with that said, Mr. Smith, a roll call vote, please. And this um, is as, as amended. I'm sorry, Ms. Councilwoman Clear, do you have a comment? Yes, I just, I did just want to make I a comment. Um, um, oh gosh, I'm sorry. I just, I just lost it. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to yield to Councilman Horton. He can go first. Okay. Go ahead. Count, Councilman Horton. Go yeah, ahead. yeah, briefly. I, I, I thank you, um, Councilman Rastad. Uh, it's not what I, uh, the finale uh, that I'm looking for, uh, but I appreciate uh, you uh, re at least trying to make it better. Um, I just want to make the distinction uh, about the state um, 50%. I think it's one of the callers who said it earlier, the 50% that's being taken from the inmates at the state facility is being taken from money that they earn uh, from working there. It's not being taken uh, from money that their loved ones are putting on their account. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Horton. And, and uh, Councilwoman Clear, do you, yes, do you I, have comments ready? Yeah, I, I do, in my head somewhere. Uh, I apologize. Um, yeah, I want to thank um, Scott for, for, for doing that. And um, as much as I, um, I, I wanted it to stay at 25% or 0%, um, again, behavior modification. Um, I, I've been doing that for 17 years as well. And uh, um, I think that um, that maybe there might be some um, education we can give on that, on what that means and what that looks like. Um, so I think that that's something that, and I think that we do need to um, do some investigative work to see you know, what's going on. I, I agree with uh, Councilman Rastatter. So thank you for that, Scott. Um, I am afraid that if I do not vote um, for this 50% um, that it could be vetoed and it would stay at 75%. So um, I, I am worried that it will stay at 75% if it's vetoed. So I believe that I'm going to be voting in favor of the 50% at this time for that reason. So I yield. Thank you. And uh, Councilman Shank, did you have uh, comments? Yes, sir, I did, thank you. Okay, go ahead, please. Just to clarify the, I hear the issue of getting paid as an inmate on the state level. As you all know, I spent 20 years as a corrections officer in a state penitentiary. Now, when we talk about pay, the, a detail worker that I would have on, on the cell block would make about 15 cents an hour. If you were a, say, the law library clerk, you would make about 50 cents an hour. So yes, they do get paid and I understand that. Um, but it's not a ton of money and they do assess the fines and the, the thing that they do different on the state is they actually can get restriction to their cells and that's something that the county does not do. So, you know, that's something that maybe they could look at instead of fines. Well, what would you rather do? Would you rather pay a fine or would you rather have 10 days in your cell on cell restriction? So, you know, those are issues and, and, and I get that and, uh, you know, it, we've talked about tools. And you know, it is a tool, unfortunately, it's not a, the best tool, but it's a tool they have to utilize. And per the warden's statement on our meeting, the average stay for an inmate at the county lockup is 53 days, uh, except if you're being held for trial. So he did clarify that. Uh, just a friendly reminder on a state level, you're there for two years or more, two years to life where you have time for drug and alcohol counseling. They have in, inpatient in-house therapeutic communities where the inmates live, breathe the drug and alcohol program. And then part of their parole would be to graduate from those programs. So the, the warden's hands are kind of tied because they're on there for a very short time frame um, because the sentencing that, that the judge would give them on a county level. So just to clarify, county lockup is about 
53 days, according to the warden. On a state level, it's two years or more. State level pay is 15 cents an hour, and the inmates have to make a decision. Gee, do I have to pay for my uh, cable, or do I get to buy sticky buns this week? So commissary, even on the state level, is exactly that. It's a privilege, just like when your kids misbehave in the house. What do you do? You take their TV away from them. Um, and it, it's just a tool we have that they have to say, hey, wait a minute, that behavior is inappropriate. You're not, it's not going to be tolerated in this county lockup and behave and you'll go home. Pretty simple. I yield back. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And with, with that said, Mr. Smith, if we could have a roll call vote uh, on uh, ordinance six as amended. Mrs. Showerman? Yes. Mr. Shank? Yes. Mrs. Clear? Yes. Mr. Horton? No. Mr. Rastatter? Yes. Mrs. Rennie? Yes. Chairman Anderson? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we go on to new business, um, they, we do have uh, a few uh, citations that are being brought forward tonight uh, by a couple different council members. And uh, I didn't want to uh, forget those. Uh, so I would like to uh, have us uh, uh, go through those now. And um, the three uh, citations we have are for Mr. Colton Brown, uh, Mr. Merle Upperman, and Mr. Robert Stru uh, Strupp and uh, uh, Scott Rastetter uh, is going to uh, present the citation or uh, some words to us about uh, Mr. Colton Brown. Councilman Rastetter. Yeah, can we start somewhere else? I can't find the citation. Okay. It's the top. Yeah, well. I had the same problem as Mary. I have two different <laughs> agendas and trying to get one of them to work isn't working. I have had it up here and I just can't find it again. Uh, Mr. Anyway. Shank, do you, do you want to begin with, with your citation? I can do that for you, sir. Okay, thank you. Please right. go ahead. There are people in our lives that we meet and when we meet them as uh, teachers, Ms. Clear, you leave an everlasting impression on those students. I remember as, as a, a seventh grader going into the high school, uh, this big tall man was in, in his machine shop and he was uh, Mr. Robert Straub. Um, Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, on council here, I've had to say goodbye to two teachers, Mr. Paul Faust and now Mr. Straub. The Straub family is a, is a large family out here in Harbor Creek, a very caring family. They lost their mother, Mrs. Straub, uh, I believe last year. So this family is tough. They will, pref they will get through this. But uh, I sit back and I, I try to remember the things I, I learned in Mr. Straub's class and I will always remember them. I told Mrs. Straub a story one time about a project that we did. And uh, if it wasn't for Mr. Straub's guidance, I don't think I would have been able to do it. I met Mrs. Straub several years ago. Uh, it was a fire call from the fire department. We showed up and this nice little lady was standing on her steps after a storm. Her basement was flooded. She had several feet of water in her basement. So of course, as a fire department, we, we pump it out and you know, we, have, we say, have a nice day. The nice lady, she went to give us money, said, man, we're just a volunteer fire department. We don't accept any money. Uh, she goes, at least let me buy your breakfast. And after talking to her, we figured out it was Mrs. Straub's wife. And what had happened, Mr. Straub had built this very complex and very creatively engineered pumping system to keep the basement from flooding. Well, unfortunately, Mr. Straub was in a hospital, uh, an extended care facility, and the pump system had failed, which made the basement flood. So what do we do? We get our tools out and we fixed Mr. Straub's pumping system so their basement wouldn't flood again. So, you know, it was kind of like full circle. As a teacher, you know, I hope you have a student that comes to you someday and says, hey, Ms. Clear, remember what you taught me. Um, I sit back and go, I can say, Mr. Faust, he taught me a lot. He was tough. Mr. Straub, he was a big man 
And uh, I guess when you're in seventh grade, everyone's a big man. So he will be missed. The Harbor Creek uh, folks out here will miss him. Uh, the family lives on. I, I, I talked to the daughters. I just talked to her the other day, sent her a copy of um, the citation. Of course, they were very moved and they wanted to say thank you. And that's all I got. I got for this story. I could go on for hours, but unfortunately, we, we do have time restraints. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rastetter, are you uh, ready with? Yeah, I got it now. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Uh, although I, I only ever met Mr. Brown once at the courthouse, he was a very pleasant and jolly individual. I can say that for sure. And uh, at the age of 24, uh, he was born in Warren, Pennsylvania. At the age of 24, he passed away from uh, uh, COVID. Am I reading that right? <laughs> he graduated from Warren High School, furthered his education at Jamestown Community College and Penn State Barron, entering a bachelor's degree in psychology. Uh, served as Erie County Adult Probation Officer beginning in November of 2019. Colt's positive demeanor, focus, and dedication to his responsibilities in the office and to the offenders he had worked with earned him high regard amongst his colleagues. Devoted to his community, family, and friends, Colt spread messages of inspiration, encouragement, and love to others. His daily Snapchats messages and the use of quotes and Bible verse, Colt was the go-to friend, always offering a helping hand, a hug, a listening ear, and valued spending time with family and friends, working on his truck, his truck Rhonda, he had a name for it, going to the gym, hunting, fishing with his pal Ryan, and travels with his father and brother, Colt was a member of the Praise Fellowship Church, Delta Chi Fraternity, North Star Lodge, number 241, the Farrah Grotto, and the Penn State Baron Competitive Cheer Team. He was also a past Mr. Penn State Baron. And in addition to his parents, Colt is survived by his brother, Cody Brown, wife, Meji, stepbrother Brandon Shields, fiance Jacqueline Couch, stepsister Patricia Shields, fiance Enrique Sanchez, stepbrother Chris Bright, wife Torin, niece Adley Brown, nephews William and Emilio Sanchez, nephew Keenan and Levi Bryce Bright, niece Raina Bright, as well as several uncles and aunts and cousins. Therefore, we, the undersigned members of Erie County Council in celebrating the life of Colton Brown as a beacon of light to those who serve, to those who, whose life he reached, may he rest in peace. Yeah, he, he was quite a guy, big guy. Passed away at the age of 24, which is terrible. Thank you, Councilman Rastetter. Uh, and uh, I think uh, everybody uh, in uh, county government uh, and those that worked with him in the court system uh, were, uh, were just uh, shocked and, uh, uh, and just uh, uh, very uh, taken aback. Uh, and, and really the... Uh, the COVID pandemic, I think, uh, really uh, was brought home to many people uh, when when it affected uh, certainly a 24 year old. So, uh, th thank you for that. Um, and then uh, finally, our third citation tonight. Uh, I have a, a citation uh, for uh, Merle Upperman, uh, Butch Upperman. Uh, I. Um, uh, I'm deeply saddened at his, uh, his passing. And, uh, uh, he was a, uh, a long time, uh, friend of mine, uh, in, in my adult years, uh, 
I had the opportunity to, uh, to know and, and graduated from high school uh, with his oldest son, uh, Terry, uh, who's a very close friend of mine. Uh, and um, uh, ironically enough, uh, my son uh, graduated with his youngest son uh, from high school and independently, uh, they ended up being uh, very good friends. So uh, if I say it a different way, uh, both uh, Merle Opperman's uh, oldest and younger son uh, each graduated high school with a Carl Anderson, uh, the Carl the third and Carl the fourth. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, I had uh, through in adulthood a, uh, a personal relationship uh, with Merle uh, through his activities in the community. Um, uh, he was a, a salesman for uh, Glenwood Beer Distributorship. Uh, he was uh, responsible for the protection of the Miller Highlight girls for many years as, uh, uh, as they were going around through uh, uh, Northwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he loved to laugh. He loved to have a good time. Uh, but he was uh, serious about uh, the love he had for uh, bowling and for uh, baseball and uh, for his, his two sons, uh, Terry and, and uh, Mitch, uh, and uh, for his wife, Vicki. And um, he is going to be uh, sorely missed uh, by all of the people that knew him, uh, by friends, but certainly by uh, members of his family. And uh, so uh, to my friend, Terry, and to uh, my son, Carl's friend, Mitch. Uh, we, we remember uh, Merle Upperman and we will never forget him. So uh, thank you for, uh, for indulging us in our citations tonight uh, and being able to present those in the uh, records of County Council uh, to be remembered forever. And with that, we'll move forward with our agenda under new business and finance chair woman clear. Uh, do you have a motion? Sorry, I'm muted. I apologize. Okay. Uh, yes, I, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to amend the agenda um, to move items A, B, D, and E to a second, as well as grouping together J through U. Um, those are the appointments as one vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We have a motion. We have a motion by uh, finance chairwoman Clear and seconded by Councilman Horton. Uh, any questions or comments of members of council? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Smith, if we could have a roll call vote on amending the agenda. Mr. Shank? Yes. Mrs. Yes. Clear? Yes. Mr. Horton. Yes. yes, yes. Thank you. Mr. Rastatter. Yes. Mrs. Rennie. Yes. Mrs. Showerman. Yes. Chairman Anderson. Yes. Thank you. Could we then have a second reading of ordinance numbers uh, seven of 2021 in title only, please? Second reading of ordinance number seven, 2021, approving a single vendor contract and renewal of the three year West Library maintenance agreement for the county law library and the court library. I moved. I'll second it. Moved by uh, Councilwoman uh, Clear and seconded by Councilwoman Showerman. Any questions or comments of members of council? Mr. Smith, may we have a roll call vote, please? On ordinance number seven, Mrs. Clear? Yes. Mr. Horton? Yes. Mr. Rastatter? Yes. Mrs. Rennie? Yes. Mrs. Showerman? Yes. Mr. Shank? Yes. 
Chairman Anderson? Yes. Mr. Smith, may we have a second reading of ordinance number eight in title only, please? A second reading of ordinance number eight, 2021, fourth, 2021 general fund budget, supplemental appropriation of $102,352 in new line item for late CARES expenses. So moved. Oh, wait. We have a motion. Yes, so moved. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. We, we have a motion by uh, Councilwoman Showerman, seconded by Councilwoman Clear. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, Mr. Smith, may we have a roll call vote, please? On ordinance eight, uh, Mr. Horton. Yes. Mr. Rastatter. Yes. Mrs. Rennie. Yes. Mrs. Showerman. Yes. Mr. Shank. Yes. Mrs. Clear. Yes. Chairman Anderson. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Smith. May we have a first reading of ordinance number nine of 2021 in title only, please. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, just a moment. No, that's okay. And just for, for those that are uh, attending our meeting tonight, uh, when we do an ordinance in council, uh, we do a first reading and then we do a second reading where we take the vote. Uh, there are times that council moves the items to a second reading uh, then to actually do the first reading and second reading on the same night. Uh, but in this case, we're leaving this as a first reading uh, and uh, we just read that ordinance and move forward until it actually goes for a vote at the next council meeting and resolutions then are voted on on the same night that they are presented on the agenda. Uh, but Mr. Smith, go ahead, please. First reading of ordinance number nine, 2021, fifth, 2021 general fund budget, supplemental appropriation of $33,334, new line item, and waiver of bid requirements for administration of community college RACP grant. Thank you. May we have a second reading of ordinance number 10, 2021 in title only, please. A second reading of ordinance number 10, 2021, first 2021 library fund budget, supplemental appropriation of $9,521 for 2020 balance of BI Innovation Network grant funds. So moved. Second. second. Thank you. The uh, motion was moved by Councilwoman Clear and seconded by Councilman Rastetter. Any questions or comments from members of council? Seeing none, Mr. Smith, may we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. On ordinance number 10, Mr. Rastetter? Yes. Mrs. Rennie? Yes. Mrs. Showerman? Yes. Mr. Shag? Yes. Mrs. Clear? Yes. Mr. Horton? Yes. Chairman Anderson? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. May we have a second reading of ordinance number 11 of 2021 in title only, please. The second reading of ordinance number 11, 2021, second 2021 library fund budget, supplemental appropriation of $1,000 for ALA connecting you to coverage grant that lapsed in 2020 due to COVID-19. Moved. Second. It was moved by Councilwoman Showerman, seconded by Councilwoman Rennie. Are there any questions or comments from members of council? 
Seeing none, Mr. Smith, may we have a roll call vote, please? An ordinance 11, Mrs. Rennie. Yes. Mrs. Showerman? Yes. Mr. Shank? Yes. Mrs. Clear? Yes. Mr. Horton? Yes. Mr. Rastatter? Yes. Chairman Anderson? Yes. Mr. Smith, may we have a first reading of ordinance number 12 of 2021 in title only, please. A first reading of ordinance number 12, 2021, 2021 library fund budget, revised expenditures of $2,600 for elimination of part-time position and creation of full-time position. Mr. Smith, may we have a first reading of ordinance number 13 of 2021 in title only. A first reading of ordinance number 13, 2021, assignation of an administrator for COVID-19 hospitality industry recovery program. Thank you. I just wanna make a quick comment on this particular item uh, that uh, this, this is an item that uh, the state uh, has released uh, money through uh, the, the COVID uh, grants uh, to Erie County. Uh, just over $3 million is being received by Erie County uh, for the hospitality industry. Uh, we need to have an administrator in place by March 1st. Uh, and we have already agreed that we will call a special meeting before March 1st, rather than moving that to a second tonight uh, to give the uh, uh, redevelopment authority uh, the opportunity to come and speak in front of council. So we will uh, deal with that issue before the end of the month. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a resolution number six of 2021. If you could read that in title only, Mr. Smith. Resolution six, 2021, Erie County Council, the Erie County Executives Administration, and the Erie County Communi Community College Board of Trustees working in unity to move the community college funding forward for the benefit of the Erie County Community College and Erie County citizens. I moved. Second. We have it moved and seconded. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councilwoman Clear. Um, I would like to amend the ordinance. Go ahead, please. Um, I would like to amend the, um, in the whereas, where it lists the um, members of the committee. I would like to add in, quote, the interim president until the president is named, who will then um, be a member of the committee. Uh, or their designee. Or their designee. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have an amendment. We have a motion for an amendment. Second that. Okay. And uh, seconded by Councilwoman Showerman. Uh, Mr. Smith, can we have a roll call vote on the amendment, please? On the amendment, Mrs. Showerman? Yes. Mr. Shank? Yes. Mrs. Clear? Yes. Mr. Horton? No. Mr. Rastatter? Yes. Mrs. Rennie? No. Chairman Anderson? Yes. The amendment passes? Um, no. The, yeah. I'm sorry. Nothing. Um, thank you. Uh, so we uh, we have it amended, and are, are there any questions or comments from members of council at this time before we vote as amended? Questions. I have questions. Uh, Mr. Horton, if you have some comments, go ahead. <clears throat> Just want to read this letter into the record that I sent out uh, to all the members of council and the administration. 
Uh, good afternoon, fellow members. I stand in opposition to resolution number six, 2021. The administration, council, and the community college board working in unity with to move community college funding forward for the benefit of the institution and Erie County citizens. While I am grateful to Chairman Anderson and Vice Chairwoman Clear for the work put forth to draft this resolution, I must contend that it is inappropriate and ill-advised, no matter how well-intentioned. I say this for a number of reasons. One, I, I believe it is an intrusion into the affairs and duties of the Erie County Community College Board of Trustees. The Erie County Community College Board is an autonomous board. It's obligated to carry out their duties as outlined under the Community College Act and their own 120 day plan. Erie County Community College Board has retained legal counsel and they've hired a very capable accountant. They've also hired Dr. Judith Gay to serve as interim president, uh, to serve as their administrator. How can council consider this action without having officially heard from Dr. Gay on the subject? Do we really want to undercut her position in this way? The administration and council have defined roles in the home rule charter in relationship to the Erie County Redevelopment Authority Board. Why do we feel the need to inject ourselves or anyone else further into Erie County Redevelopment Authority's process? I would be interested to know how the nine members of the board, Erie County Community College Board, as well as the board of Erie County Redevelopment uh, Association and their legal counsel feel about this, particularly the college board. This council already has the ability to collectively or independently request information from Erie County Community College Board and its president via a number of avenues. We can request Dr. Gay or board members come before this body. We can ask for a written report or regular updates. We can use our solicitor or even our liaison. I fail to see the need, rhyme or reason for what is proposed in resolution number six based on those reasons alone. Lastly, and of equal importance, Erie County, the Commonwealth, this nation is facing the most catastrophic pandemic event of our lifetime. Council must remain focused on its own business. This community's health and welfare, both medically and economically. Firstly, pressing the administration on health department initiatives to stop and or slow the spread of the virus. What are their plans to get vaccine to all the county residents who desire it? These activities are crucial to children and educators returning or hoping to return to in-person instruction. What about our small businesses, which are barely hanging on? We are accountable in these matters. Micromanagement of the community college is a destructive path. I urge you, my colleagues, to pull resolution number six of 2021 or vote no to affirm and acknowledge that the Erie County Community College Board of Trustees is autonomous and not bound by any of the terms proposed. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my comments. Thank you, Mr. Horton. Uh, Councilwoman Rennie, uh, you have uh, comments? Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I have to say that I concur with Councilman Horton's statements. Very well said. I will also make a few points of my own. This is a classic case of too many cooks. County Council has fiscal responsibility. Yes, it does not extend to every corner of county operations. County Council has never exercised direct oversight of initiative, 
grant projects, programs, services, facilities, that falls to administration and management. And there's a reason for that. That type of close attention to detail requires expert knowledge, professional knowledge, technical detail awareness. I will also say that the, this particular process is highly specific. This is the RACP funding, highly specific, technical, as is the administration of the RACP grant, the reporting process, the construction, any construction that is to take place. One of the major concerns of the naysayers of the community college all along was that this project would fall prey to political and special interests. It is imperative, absolutely imperative at this time that the integrity and, and autonomy of the community college board of trustees be maintained and even championed at this point. Finally, I will say that I attended the meeting yesterday. This is the executive board meeting of the community college yesterday. And I sat and listened to the chairman of the trustees completely disavow any knowledge of or support for this resolution. From what I have been told and what I have heard, I believe that there may be either a misunderstanding, a miscommunication, or a misrepresentation of Dr. Gay's feelings and thoughts regarding this resolution. For that reason, I am asking that this resolution either be pulled, tabled, or that you vote no for this resolution. That concludes my remarks. Thank you, Councilwoman Rennie. Uh, Councilwoman Clear. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I, I want uh, to start by saying that I, I completely agree with uh, Councilman Horton and Councilman Rennie's um, concerns about um, protecting the um, uh, protecting the, I'm sorry, uh, and the autonomy of the board. And I, I completely agree. I completely agree as well that uh, the community college board needs to be uh, protected from the interests, the political interests, um, completely and absolutely agree, which is why I am voting for this. And the first reason I'm, I want to vote for this is because it states inside the resolution under the fourth whereas, quote, um, the Erie County Community College Board of Trustees will have the responsibility for selecting the qualifying projects and plans for use of intended um, RACP grant funds, end quote. It states in there and it, it, it puts in writing that they are autonomous. And I think that I feel that I needed to put that in there to protect the community college and their interests. The committee itself, and I know that I am the idealist here of the group, um, I, I, when I think of a committee, I think of minds coming together or listening sessions going on once a month to make sure that we are making, uh, that no one's special interests are being used to influence the board. I am worried that in a year from now, when many of us are not gonna be on council anymore, only a few of you will be. And I think I'm scared for what's gonna happen then. Who will be the county executive at that time? It won't be Kathy Dahlkamper who has the interests of the Erie County Community College in mind. I think uh, it, maybe it's not going to be. Maybe it's not going to be us council people as well. So I, for me, the committee means listening sessions for support group. And that's what I feel the community college, uh, uh, this, I'm sorry, that's what I feel that this committee would mean. It's 
the unity of all people coming together saying, what can we do? Is there anything we can do to help? Not to tell them what to do, but to see where they are at in the process and, um, and come together as one group in unity to support each other. That's what we did with this $24 million in the, in the CARES grant last summer. And it was successful. The amount of people that we had in there and all of the minds that came together, we were able to get $24 million of government money um, in and out by the end of, um, by the end of December. I mean, it was, it, it was amazing. But that's the power of community. That's the power of people coming together. And for me, that's what this is. So I agree with holding, uh, making sure that we are, that the community college uh, board of trustees are being protected. That's what I, I feel like this is. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilwoman Clear. Are there other uh, members of council that wish to be heard? I'll just say a few words. Councilman Rastetter. Thank you, uh, Carl. Uh, I think the uh, those of us that are for this this amendment, this resolution, want to inject ourselves because we want to protect the community college and the board of trustees from an attempt by the administration to handicap the board and strap the college into the city. Well, I don't wanna give up all this work and money for a community college to just go into the city and be uh, not available to the whole county. That's just crazy. And why would we want one small group of people to run this whole thing? We already have the board of trustees that were appointed by council and the administration. And they're a very diverse crowd. Uh, but now the administration wants to be able to control the board of trustees. And that's, that's how it is. That, that's uh, <laughs> The, the typical Kathy Dahlkemper MO, try to get her little fingers on everything and, and guide it into wherever she wants it to be, not where council wants it to be, not where the constituents want it to be, just to help Kathy Dahlkemper and her, her friends. And I won't say any more because I'll get myself in trouble. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman Rastetter. Are there any other uh, council members that wish to be heard? Mary's got her hand up. Uh, Mary, Mary, as in all issues, uh, when, once you've been recognized and made your comments, uh, you, you're not recognized to make comments again. Well, I, would, I would like to move that we table this based on uh, gross problems with the factual content that was presented today. Well, they're, they're your gross problems of factual content, but uh, we're not done with the, the commentary being made now. Uh, so it would be inappropriate to make to do that right now. Uh, Mr. Rassetter, are you done with your comments? Uh, yes, sir. Sorry, I thought I made that clear. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shank? Thank you, sir. Scott and I, we love to go back and forth and we kid each other, but I, I got to agree with Scott on this one, 100%. Um, you know my position on the community college from day one. I, I have not hit it or made it silent. I, now that it's in our lap, I want to make sure it's done properly and it's put in the proper locations. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of uh, push from the administration, uh, the city of Erie to have it on the Lower East Side, downtown. I mean, I don't think that kind of reflects a community college when we have folks that live in Albion, we have folks that live in Summit, we have folks that live in Green Township, the Northeast. And to me, uh, the, down on that Lower East Side, I, I just think it's, it's I, I know it's a noble cause. Let's get the community college up and running. Let's put a satellite down there. I mean, and that's something we can do. We have, we have a lot of options here on the table. 
but uh, and, and again, I got to go with Scott. And I'll just make it a little softer. Um, I don't particularly trust Kathy Dalkamper on this issue, and I don't think she needs to have control of have her fingers on it where it needs to go. And I will yield back and thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, in, any other members of council wish to be heard? Uh, Councilwoman Showerman. I'll just say that I, this resolution really doesn't take any autonomy or authority away from the Board of Trustees at all. It's just working together, having a committee to keep communications open and making sure that everything is, um, I guess I'm gonna use the word communicated again um, to every all the parties involved. And I don't feel it takes any authority or autonomy away from them at all. All the decisions are still theirs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, each member of council has uh, spoken, so uh, I'm going to uh, speak now uh, as one of the uh, crafters of this resolution uh, and proud to be so uh, because I've been there to protect the community college effort every single step of the way. And I will continue to protect it every single step of the way. Uh, not only is this appropriate, this resolution, but is absolutely and unequivocally necessary. And yes, uh, as some of my colleagues said earlier, to keep it away from the political and special interest groups that are lurking around, suggesting somehow uh, that they're not involved in uh, partaking in discussions on what's happening with the community college, that somehow that they've left it to the autonomy of the community college board of trustees to be on their own. When they're there every single step of the way, behind the scenes, behind closed doors, whispering, suggesting, threatening, maneuvering, cajoling, to get their agenda pushed forward, uh, an agenda that does not represent a majority of this council or a majority of this county government. Never in my wildest dreams would I imagine that a resolution put forward with the words supportive, unity, experience, responsibility, encourage, collaborate, empower, teamwork, partnership, togetherness, discussions, conversation, communications, priorities and destination, a pledge of cooperation and partnership, a pledge for unity, a pledge to successfully move this endeavor forward. Never in my wildest dreams did I believe that those words would create so much controversy and so much concern by those people who put forth an ordinance to take control of the entire RACP funding without one time connecting with, collaborating with, talking to, having discussions, or work with the Community College Board of SD Trustees. The exact same thing that they're saying this resolution puts forward when this resolution spells it all out right in front of us in a very transparent and open way that we all work together in unity and that we transform this community once and for all in unity. I will submit that a super member, a majority member of this council uh, will support this resolution because that's what the community wants us to see. In fact, that's what the community is demanding that they see from us. When I put together the task force two years ago and then the committee under resolution 30, the collaboration and unity of all of us working together, whether we disagreed behind the scenes or behind closed doors or not, 
we agreed that when we came forward with the general public, we would all agree in the decisions that were being made. And that's what allowed the broader community to see that all of us were working in unity to move the community college forward. And that's where we're at. But as I said Thursday at the finance meeting, when it comes to the money, look out. Because this is the most important endeavor that the members of county council are going to partake in. Without question, the most important endeavor. And when the administration put their ordinance forward, they did it without collaboration, without support, without contacting the Community College Board of Trustees. And this document in and of itself can be broken down to one word, insurance. It's an insurance policy to ensure that the Community College Board of Trustees are a central part of any discussions that happen in relationship with the community college moving forward. The makeup of the committee itself has four members of the board of trustees, three members of the administration and two members of council. Even though county council is the sponsor of the community college, we are taking the, the smallest endeavor uh, as part of this committee. But what I suggest to you is uh, that the RACP funding that's being moved forward, $10 million, uh, that we have the opportunity uh, to receive from the state. It's a reimbursement program. How we set this up now for the future councils, for the future administration, is going to be imperative. Because as it was suggested earlier, many of us, if not all of us, won't be here by the time this project is concluded. So to answer the questions of who's been in, in contact with who, I've been in contact uh, with everybody involved in a community college process, including the administration. I was invited to meetings by the administration. I've been in, in, in contact with the governor's office when these funds were received. And the administration's process of uh, choosing the uh, administrator for this was a sham, an absolute sham. But we'll talk about that when we bring that ordinance forward uh, because there was no process. It was specifically designed to be geared towards one specific organization, which is controlled by the administration. So it was suggested at that meeting that had representatives of the community college board the administration and council, that the administration bring forward this resolution to suggest the committee, to show the community that we're all working in unity. And they chose to bring their own committee forward and to keep it within the administration. In fact, they chose uh, to uh, deny uh, having any other partners in, in, involved in this. When we asked them if, if they would suggest uh, having uh, the expansion of this committee uh, put forward, uh, or if they would answer specific uh, elements uh, to ensure that the community college board uh, was a central part of the uh, process that was moving forward. Uh, they, they denied uh, any, any uh, involvement uh, of wanting to part participate in that. Um, this is uh, in no way uh, any kind of a uh, black eye or oversight of the community college board. Uh, but frankly, I will tell you, this is a complete oversight of the administration who would like to do all of this on their own. They are listed as the applicant and sub-applicant, the grantee and the sub-grantee of the RACP application when the intended recipient is the community college itself. 
the community college board of trustees should be listed as the sub grantee, uh, but they won't do that. There are experts all across the state that can provide the information and the knowledge uh, that, that we need to be able to move this forward. Uh, but they say that the only one standing is the redevelopment authority. The redevelopment authority, who one of the members of the community college board has gone to as the expert for the only inventory of locations that are available throughout all of Erie County. But yet the administration says they're not going to uh, overstep by being involved in the site selection process. It's a sham. And their hand was caught in the cookie jar. And do we want to have a, a resolution like this? No, we want to be able to all work together. I think it was suggested before. We shouldn't have to do this. We, we should all be able to work together and collaborate. So we didn't want to have to put this resolution together, but the resolution is put together because we have to show unity to the broader community. The philanthropic community is demanding that as we move forward uh, with this endeavor, we continue to show unity, all of us working together. And county council's responsibility has not diminished one bit by giving autonomy to the board of directors. In fact, it's increased because we are responsible for ensuring that the money is spent. It's all a reimbursement process. And to the uh, administration themselves, they have admitted this is a three, five, seven, 11 year process where most of us won't even be here. So what we do today and how we get this right now is of critical importance for future representatives of council and members of the administration, and especially for the taxpayers of Erie County. We, we have to make sure that we document and, and that we have the receipts for and understand the reimbursement process. And that can only be done by collaboration and us working together. Uh, so yes, th this is important that we move this forward tonight. It's important that we have unity. It's important that we have collaboration. In fact, it's essential. And that's what we're moving forward tonight to ensure that the Community College Board of Trustees has their autonomy and has their independence. So they are the ones making the decisions. That's exactly what this document says. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even take the redevelopment authority out of the process because they, we, we want them to be part of the process. We need all of us to be part of the process. We're not the ones that moving this resolution forward who are the ones that are afraid of collaboration. Uh, it's those that would suggest that us moving collaboration forward is somehow a bad word. The, those are the ones that, that I would submit to you are the ones that we should be concerned aren't really worried about collaboration. So that, that's why we have this resolution and that's why we're gonna continue to move it forward. Um, with that being said, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, is this set to be uh, voted on uh, as it is, or if Mrs. Rennie is uh, asking for a motion uh, to table, does she still have the, the, the right to present that motion? I wanna give her that option. Uh, yes, she would have the right to make that motion without okay. debate. Thank you. Uh, Mary, if you wanted to make, continue to make that motion, you can do that and then it's made without debate. Thank you. I would like to move that we table this for further information gathering. There a second. Is there a second on the motion? Seeing none, it fails uh, to have a second. Mr. Smith, can we have a roll call vote on the resolution as amended? Yes, Mr. Shank. I got a 
gotta go first on this one. Wow, <laughs> I, I'm gonna go yes. This is clear. I don't think he heard you. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Horton. No. Mr. Rastetter. Yes. Mrs. Rennie. No. Mrs. Showerman. Yes. Chairman Anderson. Absolutely. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Can we uh, move on to the possible sale of the uh, parcel in the repository? Uh, could you read that for us? Yes. Um, the Tax Claim Bureau has received an offer to purchase property commonly known as and identified as in the assessment records of Erie County as index number 03-016-029 point zero dash zero zero five point zero zero Concord Road. It's a trailer parcel. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilwoman Showerman, second by Councilwoman Clear. Mr. Smith, can we have a roll call vote, please? On the sale of the parcel in our agenda, Mrs. Clear. Yes. Mr. Horton? Yes. Mr. Rastetter? Yes. Mrs. Rennie? Yes. Mrs. Showerman? Yes. Mr. Shank? Yes. Chairman Anderson? Yes. Next on our agenda are a number of items for a possible appointment or reappointment to a number of, uh, of, of authorities or boards. Uh, and we've amended the agenda to include them all as one item. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, moved by Councilman Shank, seconded by Councilwoman Clear. Are there any comments or questions in regards to any of the appointments? Seeing none, Mr. Smith, can we have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Horton? Yes. Mr. Rastetter? Yes. Mrs. Rennie? Yes. Mrs. Showerman? Yes. Mr. Shank? Yes. Mrs. Clear? Yes. Chairman Anderson? Yes. Thank you. With no other uh, business to come before uh, council tonight, um, I would just note that our next uh, per finance and personnel meeting will be February 25th at 4 p.m. And the next regular council meeting will be March 2nd at 4 p.m. Uh, but as I had mentioned earlier, uh, we will plan to have a special council meeting uh, for the purpose of, uh, of uh, choosing the administrator for uh, the, uh, the business funds that have come through from uh, uh, the state uh, in regards to uh, uh, CARES money. Uh, and we will do that before March 1st uh, and certainly uh, put that notice out in due time. So uh, with that said, with no other business to, to come before the council, I would ask for a motion for adjournment. So move. Second. Thank you. Council's adjourned. Bye everybody. Thank you everyone. Stay home, stay safe. Thank you everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye.